We're delighted this morning to have incoming Cincinnati Police Chief James Craig, along with City Manager Milton Dahoney, to help us all become better acquainted with uh, Chief Craig. Thanks very much for your willingness to do Thank this. Thank you. Appreciate we really it. really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, as we've already said, we are streaming this meeting live on video on Cincinnati.com for our online readers. And our politics ex uh, editor, Carl Weiser, is going to be conducting a live chat with the readers along okay. with the meeting as well. I'm Ray Cookus from the editorial page. Also with us are the editor of the Inquirer, Carolyn Washburn, well, columnist Krista Thank Ramsey, yes. Digital Opinions Manager Kristen right. Wellesley, Carl Weiser, reporter Carrie Whitaker, and others from our staff. Right. We're going to try to make this a good conversation, and we're including some questions for Chief Craig that have already been sent in by our, our readers, along with maybe some comments that uh, Carl will pass along from the live chat. Okay. So I'd like to start off by asking you this question. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dahoney has already told us a lot about the qualities that he saw in you that led him to select you for this post. But I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what qualities or characteristics or perhaps potentials you saw in Cincinnati that made you want to apply for the post. Well, you know, I saw Cincinnati job advertisement January, actually. I became very excited. Uh, it's no secret I was born in in Detroit, Michigan. In Detroit, Michigan and Cincinnati, there's a definite connection there. We're talking about the Midwest. Uh, and so it was an opportunity to come home, but more importantly, to use the skills that I've been able to uh, learn and develop and hone over a span of 35 years in policing. Uh, I felt, you know, as I looked at the challenges uh, and the history of Cincinnati, I felt in my heart that I would be a good fit here. Uh, certainly when I met the city manager, uh, I felt connected to the city manager. Uh, I think it, when you look at police chiefing and police chiefs that uh, go out into cities, part of the assessment that the candidate makes is, will that be a good fit? The city manager does it, of course, or in some cities, mayors, because that's a very important relationship. So I weighed all those things as I evaluated uh, uh, my desire, and as I got deeper into the process, as I began to really uh, understand Cincinnati, I became more excited about it for, for a lot of reasons. So what's, as a police chief, what's unique about a Midwestern city? Well, you know, now having worked on two coasts in the Midwest, I've, I've had the unique opportunity to work, you know, Portland being on the East Coast, L.A. on the West Coast, and certainly Detroit in the Midwest. Uh, you know, Midwesterns are uh, good people, friendly people, uh, and that's not to slight any other places in the country. Uh, there's a willingness to work. I mean, it's, it's a place where people don't mind rolling their sleeves up, getting your hands dirty. Uh, and when you talk about police chiefing and, and working in communities, it's good to know that you have a community that will work uh, and get their hands dirty with the police department. I mean, one example here in Cincinnati is the uh, Citizens on Patrol. There's so many places that miss an opportunity. Uh, and when that's the essence of what community policing is about. You talked um, earlier today, I think, about um, averting violence. Can you talk, talk a little bit about that? Because I, um, you know, we did uh, coverage a few months ago about you know, the 10th anniversary of uh, the riots. and what we all learned from that and some of what we heard from the community is we're still worried about guns on the streets in some neighborhoods um, we're still worried about pockets where violence seems seem entrenched at the same time there are places in the community where that really is not an issue and then we have this perception largely in the suburbs that this is not a safe place I mean so how do you where do you focus in terms right. of averting violence and at the same time do that in a way that doesn't uh, you know, further this perception that the city is a violent place. You know, that's a, you know, safety uh, certainly uh, is very important, but not just me sitting here and holding up a, uh, uh, it's no secret that I was uh, very much involved in ComStat uh, in the Los Angeles Police Department, computer statistics, and uh, brought ComStat to the Portland Police Department. And it's nice to have statistics and show a 10 or 15 percent reduction 
But at the end of the day, uh, when you ask community members do they feel safe, um, and they say, well, we're still having drive-by shootings, uh, young men are still being murdered in the streets, no, I don't feel safe. So your 10% reduction means nothing to me. Uh, that's a guide for me. But when you talk about averting uh, violence, you know, I look at things and approach it uh, in a very strategic way. Uh, because certainly uh, you can go in and say, well, community A has an inordinate number of violence, you know, homicides, drive-by shootings. And some may think that the best response to that is just, you know, saturating the area uh, with high visible patrols and arrest anyone who moves. That does not work. That's a Band-Aid. Of course, police presence will have an impact on uh, reducing activity, but it's a Band-Aid. Uh, focused enforcement is the real key. You hear a lot about me talking about focus enforcement. You can go into a community, and we will know uh, where the trends and the clusters of activity are occurring. But the key is identifying those people who are responsible for the violence. When you do that, you identify them, you arrest them, take because they're, they're the problem. But more importantly, at the same time, concurrent with identifying the perpetrators um, is being able to engage the community in a true partnership where they feel a part and return that community back to the good people, the majority, because the people I'm talking about represent uh, one or two percent, a very small percentage, but being able to know who is responsible. Now, if you can avert and use prevention strategies or intervention strategies uh, to save someone, then that certainly is a preferred way. But you also have to think about the future. And when I talk about the future, I'm talking about the young people that live in the neighborhood. How do you redirect them away from the violence? And certainly I can talk all afternoon about the work that I've been involved in with youth, youth initiatives, whether it's explorers, whether it's uh, deputy auxiliary police, car shows, plays, uh, days of dialogues in high schools, going to a youth correctional facility, meeting with uh, young inmates to talk about hope. These things are very significant. When you build relationships with police officers, when young people, you replace the draw that a group of gang may have on that young person. That's a fact. I've seen it happen. And the thing that draws young people into this life of violence is the, the and this may sound strange, but it's the love that the gang or the group shows for that person. And they believe that because their homeboy, as it's called in the streets, loves them, uh, that in some way means that they're going to protect them and this is the right kind of lifestyle. But if that's all you know, and you have generations of uh, parents and their parents who've been uh, involved or embroiled in this life of crime, you can still turn that young person around. So there are a lot of youth programs in our community and lots of communities. What, why is a police youth program different? Because it's the mentoring and the relationship building. That's why it's important with police, with police officers because, see, when police officers are mentoring and engaging youth, the youth are getting to know and trust police officers. Uh, I told the story earlier about a, uh, an area I worked in where it was ravaged by violent, one of the most violent gangs in the city of Los Angeles. And so what we did is we went to the local high, uh, middle school, not high school, but middle school, and identified, I went to the principal and said, I'd like to start a boot camp on campus. I need the 25 most at-risk youth, your problems, the ones who are just on that edge. And there's a lot of resistance, candidly. Schools didn't want to work with us, they didn't believe in it. Uh, but he agreed reluctantly, and we started a boot camp. We worked with the parents. It was a three-day effort, uh, Monday, Wednesday, after-school program, four hours on Saturday. I was directly involved as a commanding officer because I wanted to model what I wanted the officers to do and see. Uh, and so the officers that were selected to engage in this were officers that uh, had a love for these young children. And these were young children that hated the police, that saw their parents arrested by police. In some instances where family members and friends had been 
uh, shot by police officers. But we were able to take that 25, that group of 25 in a 10 week period and turn them totally around. That doesn't happen by accident. And so what impact does that have on the future young person who could go into a life of crime? They will never forget the only one concern I had, certainly, that at the conclusion of the 10 weeks, how do we stay connected? So one way is that we already have you know, existing youth programs like Explorers and these deputy auxiliary police. And so I don't know enough about Cincinnati yet, but I would like to take a look at our youth programs. Are we in the neighborhoods that need us? Are we doing the work of intervention? Are we mentoring these young peoples? to turn their lives around. That's the key. This is not something I read in a book. This is an effort I saw happen, transformed. I saw it happen in South Los Angeles. I saw it happen in Portland, where in Portland we had new immigrants, immigrant youth, that were attacking the police on a regular basis. Anytime police also responded to a call for service in a housing development where the immigrant youth live, they would attack the police. And that stopped. And you know why it stopped? Because of our work with the youth, the youth initiatives, working in the high schools, the correctional facilities. We had a car show just three weeks ago now uh, uh, focused on our youth. Those things work, even though I happen to be a car buff, so it was easy to, to do it. But at the end of the day, big dividends from it. Had two, first in the history of Los Angeles, where we launched uh, two car shows in urban L.A., where we had 3,500 plus people show up, uh, community residents come out to show their vehicles, and youth, some who were involved in gangs, but came out and the connection was made. And we use that as an opportunity uh, to recruit young people into our programs. I know you, you've already mentioned a little bit about uh, partnerships with community. I know that's something that's very important to you. And you have, I believe, during this visit, taken those steps to kind of, you know, connect yourself with some of those groups. What, what are your thoughts on, uh, on the groups that, you know, you want to be working with here? And, and how do you think you're going to proceed from there when, when you come back in? Very encouraged about the groups, the people I've met so far. There's a willingness. When I look at the collaborative, I mean, here's the uniqueness, and, and, and this is the thing that's so encouraging. Uh, it's not just a group of people dissatisfied with the police department, how this came about, but you have a collaborative. For, you, got, you have the police union. I will tell you candidly, I would never dream to see the Los Angeles Police Union, union involved in that kind of effort. And I'm not slamming the uh, Los Angeles Police Department or the union because I have fond memories there. I'm just saying that I remember going uh, through a consent decree, and I remember the resistance to it. Uh, I remember the, uh, uh, the push it took to get police officers to embrace former gang criminals who decided to turn their life around and become uh, gang workers, if you will, to abate the violence. That was a very tough thing to convince police officers on the value of working with ex-gang members. Uh, but it worked. And so I'm encouraged about the, the collaborative work that goes on here in Cincinnati. I think Cincinnati is ahead. I've had an opportunity to talk to some of the scholars that were on the ground for the architects of the SERVE initiative. Uh, and, and talking to the one architect uh, who's a scholar out of Boston, who was part of the Boston ceasefire, you know, I'm encouraged because some of the things in my mind when I look at the, the level of violence today here in Cincinnati, you know, I want to understand how we can take serve to the next level. And it's a great effort. Is there anything that's missing? I don't know. It's too early for me to even pass judgment. But I like it. It's out-the-box thinking. It's innovative. It's a, a group of people, so I'm encouraged by the, the relationships that was, are here. Yeah, I was thinking that kind of ties into what you were talking about, about the, the focus and the targeted identifying people who, you know, the, the few who are the troublemakers yes. and the people involved in that. And that's exactly the type of thing they're doing, using the data and, you know, maps and everything else. 
Exactly. Well, I, I must say I had an opportunity to visit the uh, communication center and just the technology, the work that the Cincinnati Police Department is currently doing, it's amazing. Uh, I, I can't say that I was so impressed. And I started to think as I was going through it and meeting with the different units, how we can take it to the next level. You know, as I talked a little bit about COMSTAT, which is acronym for computer statistics. Again, I am a big believer in that. I'm, I'm a big believer because one thing COMSTAT does in addition to giving police officers information about crime, that's important. The police officer on the beat needs to know that in District 4 there's been an increase of street robberies, say along Martin Luther King Boulevard. And those street robberies are occurring at between the hours of 8 and midnight. And they're being perpetrated by uh, males who ride bicycles. That's important information. So the cop on the beat gets to know it, and he can focus, again, focused enforcement. And you probably won't hear a lot of that talk nationally. That's kind of a, I call it maybe a little bit of a James Craig-ism. Uh, just like when you look at Comstat that uh, started in New York um, and came to Los Angeles, uh, and you, if some of you have seen the show The Wire and how, you know, command level officers have stood up and really drilled about activity in their district or in their areas, as it was called in L.A. A very uh, humiliating experience and certainly not one that fosters an environment of engagement. Although parts of Comstat does do that, personally, I never liked it. I think there's a lot of value in it. But I think the model I used in Portland, in a very collegial way, we sat around and we identified the crime trends and clusters, and we problem solved, and we communicated throughout the organization. One of the problems I've heard from the officers here, and this is not a criticism of the department, it's a cultural reality. The detectives and in, in the uniform folks may not be talking in the way they need to talk. That's not new. That's common through a lot of police departments. Comstat cements that. Comstat submits uh, that information to the community uh, because it's good to be able for a community member to know that in there in District One, the crime picture for this month looks like this. The transparency of it, uh, transparency work, and I think that's one of the things that when I brought Comstat to um, of Portland and worked with it very closely in Los Angeles, the community appreciates knowing what's going on in their neighborhood. But again, numbers alone do not render success. Again, if I say we have a 12% reduction in overall crime, but people in District 4 still feel unsafe, then we haven't accomplished anything. So can you talk more about that? Because some of that gets a policing technique and some of it gets to budget. You know, I mean, there's there's been a lot of debate in this community about the right number of officers, and there are people who, you know, that's the only way they can see safety, and so the number of officers matters a lot to some people. Does that over matter? I'm, um, I'm, I'm very careful when I respond because it does matter, but then it depends on how the organization is operating. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that the city manager and I talked about, and he, he, he really wants to support this happening, is a, an evaluation of the department uh, that's conducted by police professionals that understand policing. Uh, I have had conversations with individuals who do that kind of work, who have conducted transitions in some very large departments across the country. And it's an invaluable resource. But it's a resource that can really save communities money. You know, you hear me talk a lot about Comstat because Comstat is also an opportunity to save money. You know, one of the things, it's no secret that, you know, when I went into Portland, uh, I like to call them quick wins. Uh, you know, the officers, you know, for years had wanted a schedule change. I think it was like 15 years of my predecessors basically said no wouldn't even entertain a, a change in work schedule. Well, within three months, we changed the work schedule. Um, 
and the beauty in it, police officers were happy, but we were able to save money. We were able to reduce overtime uh, in Portland standards substantially. Uh, it would be a drop in a bucket here. And so looking at the inefficiencies of an organization, it's not a criticism of an organization, but sometimes when you come in with an outside view, for example, this is kind of a funny story, but, but real. I come into Portland PD uh, and I see this full uniformed, uh, full duty officer uh, moving cars from headquarters to the repair garage. And I'm thinking he's going to get his car repaired. Uh, he said, oh no, this is my job. Uh, I jockey cars back and forth all day. So you, you must be kidding me. Gross inefficiency. But when I ask the question, why do we do that? And when people say, well, it's always been that way. That's clue number one, something's wrong. So it's those kind of things, and that's the beauty of having an outside perspective. So will you, uh, I guess, commission that kind of audit? Well, we've talked, it's, it's early now. We, uh, the city manager and I have had discussions about that, how that audit looks, who conducts it. It's, it's premature. Uh, but we both believe that's good business, uh, and, and certainly uh, with that kind of audit, uh, and certainly my outside perspective, and, and not leaving out, you know, the men and women in the department, because I want to hear from them as well. You know, it's amazing. If you want to know what's wrong in a police department or how we can work better, go to the line officer, the officer on the beat. They'll tell you. They'll tell you in a heartbeat. It doesn't take the assistant chief or the police chief. The line officers know. And, and, and part of the problem in organizations, generally in organizations, is that when you're in a command and control hierarchical structure, there's a resistance to receive information uh, from uh, the line staff. It's always a resistance. It happens in private sector companies too. But your better performing companies, you'll see that they have a transformational leadership style where, you know, all employees are embraced. We all take ownership. I want the officers to feel like they're part of this, not just people we give directions to and say, just get it done. So the city manager has also said that we need to be open to having fewer officers in order to deal with the city's budget issues. What have you said to him about that, and how do you manage that message with your staff? I think that's a real possibility. I'm, I'm certainly in full agreement. Uh, I think, again, like dealing with the community in a very transparent way, I think dealing with the officers in a transparent way uh, is important. I know I lived uh, as a young police officer being laid off, not knowing whether I was going to have a job the next day, and then all of a sudden getting the slip says, you're laid off. That's not how you do people. You know, I want to be up front and candid. I mean, we're, we're in a budget crisis, and we could lose some officers. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and uh, say, I'm going to do everything I can do to fight. Uh, this is a city that has a lot of demands, uh, and the public safety budget, as you all know, is very significant. What we need to do is find ways of reducing that impact. And, if it may, and you know, it's no secret that staffing uh, costs is what drives a budget, especially when you talk about police budgets. When you look at the efficiency or inefficiency of a police department, you know, how much of it is budget personnel budgeted or how much is it in supplies, training, equipment. I can't overstate the value of making sure that your uh, police officers and support staff are well trained. That's called risk management. If you don't train police officers, uh, you may not pay today, you will pay later. Training is critical. And so we have to make those tough decisions. If it means uh, reducing staffing le levels, if it means restructuring the organization, restructuring is no secret to me. I've done it in several of my former assignments. I've done it uh, in Portland where I, re I restructured the entire department to, be, to, to allow it to become a more efficient running organization. And some tough decisions had to be made. Some of the uh, discussion here, uh, particularly in recent months, has gone beyond even just restructuring the police department, but uh, doing mergers and uh, in, and consolidations, 
with other departments, mm -hmm. other uh, policing forces here. What are your thoughts on that sort of thing? Have you seen that kind of thing work? Is it something that uh, you feel you would have the flexibility and ability to lead through if it does become a necessity? Absolutely. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, uh, working in partnership with other agencies in, in Portland, Maine, we took our dispatch center and uh, basically took it in, and brought in a lot of the suburban communities to cut costs. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, only two crime labs in the entire state. Uh, our crime lab is a regional crime lab, a cost savings to those smaller communities, a cost savings to Portland. Uh, so I'm a big believer in looking for ways on how we can shave costs uh, because sometimes, as I said earlier, we do things because we've always done it that way. doesn't mean uh, it's the right way. I am happy, though, that, you know, uh, and this is certainly not a slam on sheriff's departments across the country. I just think when you talk about community policing and the kind of service we do, uh, that's not and has not been a strong shoot of, of uh, sheriff's departments. I think I, I speak from a place of experience. I come from a place, you talk about Southern California, where uh, sheriffs are very dominant in terms of policing uh, cities, uh, cities that are running into a financial crisis, and the sheriffs come in and pro provide, provide policing services. But there's a trade-off, and the trade-off is you'll get the cost of service handled, but you're not going to get all the things you've heard me talk about, when you talk about youth programs, when you talk about community policing, you will get bare bones service. And why is that? Why could you not get those things to? Cost. If, if the sheriff's department is going to say, we're going to show you how we're going to save money, and this is how we're going to do it. We were, now, as any marketer would do uh, in marketing a service, of course they would tell you that uh, you're going to have what uh, the Los Angeles Police Department provides us, all these little fluff programs, community policing. We'll do it. We'll do it at a lower cost. There are several jurisdictions. I know the, the city of Compton in Southern California, a city that was uh, plagued with lots of gang violence. Uh, their police department disbanded uh, and sheriffs took over so they could do it cheaper. Now some 10 years later, City of Compton is paying as much as they would have paid if they had uh, retained their police department. And they're still not getting the service level. And when I talk about service, it's not just you pick up 911 and we come to your house. I'm talking about those other things like, uh, you know, prevention, intervention, education, working in schools. Those, to some, may look like luxury items. I would submit they're not luxury items. This is about the future of a community. And when you are a police department as part of the community, that's different. You're not transporting uh, a law enforcement entity in to provide bare bones services. Now that does not mean that we shouldn't work together and do things. I think when you talk about consolidations, when you talk about jails, that sheriffs do very well, that's good business. But that's what they do, custody. Municipal police departments do policing in a very different way. And, you know, this might infuriate my colleagues on the sheriff's side, but uh, you will find as we uh, go down the track together is uh, I do tell the truth. That's important to me. I have a quick question. I think mm -hmm. it might be. I keep, have just a few more minutes to talk to you about it, but a lot of people say that one of the issues at the heart of violent crime in Cincinnati is drugs. Hmm. How do you take on the issue of drugs? You know, drugs is uh, an issue that when you want to look at what's going on in a community, uh, property-related offenses, violent crime, you know, drugs at the center, I took a very strong stand on rock cocaine in the state of Maine, uh, so much so that we introduced legislation uh, to the legislator. I knew definitively that everything that was going on in Portland, Maine, and southern Maine, centered around rock cocaine and the addicts that were uh, breaking in homes and cars and uh, the level of violence that was occurring were all centered around rock cocaine. What I found out to my surprise is that 14 grams of cocaine was regarded a misdemeanor in the state of Maine. 
And I got a lot of pushback because people perceived that I wanted to lock more people up. This is not about locking people up. In fact, I will, you would never hear me say that arrest is the sole answer. You cannot arrest away a problem, be it gang, group violence, can't do it. But you have to be in a position where you can use intervention or prevention. And the prosecutors in Maine, the drug prosecutors know that if it's a misdemeanor, 14 grams of cocaine is like a mountain. I mean, that's not personal use. And so what was happening, New Yorkers and Philadelphians and Bostonians were coming in to Maine targeting a vulnerable population. And they're bringing in the cocaine because if you get stopped, it's a misdemeanor. You will slap on the hand. But more important is being able that the prosecutors and the courts can use the leverage of putting them in drug programs, drug treatment. It's a misdemeanor. You can't do that. And so the drug problem, I don't know what it's like here in Cincinnati yet or what the cause is or where it's coming from for that matter. Uh, I would suspect that a lot of the group and gang violence here is over drug territory. That's usually what it is. So again, as I had stated earlier, target enforcement, put the drug house out of business, close it down. I started a neighborhood prosecutor program. Uh, worked with neighborhood prosecutors in LA, transported the concept to Portland, but really took it to the next level because that prosecutor was indeed a prosecutor. And it dealt with the low hanging fruit, the quality of life crimes. Because if you have a community that has decay and an obvious look where crime can feel comfortable, you will have crime. So while you're focusing in on the key perpetrators that's driving the violence, the drugs, you focus on them. You disrupt the leadership of these groups. You take out the drug house, close them down, restore the community back to the people that it belongs to. You deal with the, the couch that's sitting out on someone's front lawn, or the graffiti scrolled on the side, where the landlord is not taking responsibility in ensuring that their property should be well kept. Or the landlord who decides to rent to the drug dealer, and when they become aware of it, do nothing. Those are the kind of things that continue this cycle. And you want to change the character of a neighborhood. You take care of the big and small things at the same time. So what, how, what would we expect to see differently in the way of code enforcement? Um, how do you, do you, some of that is outside policing, right? That's in other parts of, of uh, city services. Again, I don't know enough about how Cincinnati works with code enforcement. I know I can only draw on what my current experience has been. I know that the city of Portland had a code enforcement officer, but there was no connection uh, to the police department. In fact, there was a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with the community because nothing was ever done. So when we launched the Neighborhood Prosecutor Program, uh, I must say I got resistance from the DA's office. I got resistance from the city attorney. They didn't believe in it. They thought uh, I was on Mars someplace, to be honest. But we pushed forward, got a federal grant. We tied it directly into our community policing efforts. They worked closely by our senior lead officers, our youth programs. And I will tell you right now, one of the things that the people talk about in addition to other things is that neighborhood prosecutor. We have changed. One example, there was a a problem location in, a, in, a, in an area that uh, had drugs and you name it going on uh, and we would it was just a constant problem by the community they kept complaining we put the neighborhood prosecutor in there she focused on uh, the problem landlord uh, year to date uh, we've seen an 80 percent reduction in calls for service in that community 80 percent and why because the neighborhood prosecutor focused on that house, that one house that was the magnet for everything else that was wrong in that community. The good people in the community couldn't do anything about it. Many were moving out of neighboring uh, apartment buildings. 80% reduction. And as I oftentimes say, it didn't happen by accident. What, what role does, do racial issues or racism play in policing and how do you deal with that? Um, race, racism. Uh, I will tell you, having worked in different places, 
I believe that we approach things in a colorblind way. And, and, and the way I have dealt with race over the years successfully, and I have, you know, worked in a very diverse department to one that was 99.9% .9 white. Uh, people want to be treated fairly. But also, I'm a believer that if inside the house, inside your police stations, if we can't have honest discussion, open discussions about race, how can I or you expect the police department to effectively police communities. So I'm a believer in, let's throw it out on the table, let's talk about it, you know. I'm not the black police chief. I am a police chief, a professional police chief with a lot of experience. I police chief for everyone in this community who happens to be African American. And with that, I bring a unique uh, uh, experience of being an African American, growing up in Detroit, and understanding the challenges that an African American male goes through as a young man. But I also understand, and I've been through an evolution of policing in the United States where minorities and females were not welcome in police departments. I remember my first day uh, in Detroit, 1977, in the field, when there was a push to integrate the police department with African Americans uh, and women in a city that was 80% black. And the white officer, who was my training officer, told me, I don't want you here, I don't like you. You just sit there and be black, don't do anything. That was my welcome to the Detroit Police Department. And so as a 19-year-old male, what was going through my time? What was going through my mind? And then years later, only a few short years going to the LAPD, I guess I always have my first nighters, my welcome to the police department. <laughs> Graduate from the police academy, I get assigned to an area in Venice, California, kind of a beachy kind of area. Uh, only three African Americans in the whole station working. And we were three recruits uh, separated uh, on different shifts. And um, I'm working the graveyard shift. That t typically is the place where the things happen under the cloak of darkness. And so I'm sitting there first day all proud in my LAPD uniform in the front row like we had to sit. Uh, and as officers do, they describe the events of the prior night. Um, and that's when the one officer referred to his encounter uh, with a black suspect using a racial epithet. And I thought, what have I got myself into? I'm 3,000 miles from home. Is this what I can expect for the next however many years? Uh, uh, but again, uh, dealing with those issues in a very bold and courageous way, uh, you know, I have been successful in working with all races, whether it's in the community or whether it's inside the police department. Because I'm honest. I'll throw it right out there. If you get the slight bit uncomfortable with talking about race, what's going on? Let's talk about it. What, uh, how do you deal with perceptions by some people that it's not safe to come into the city? Oh, it's safe to come into the city. Cincinnati is a great city. But how do you deal with perceptions well, by some people? Education, transparency. Uh, sometimes when you hear about homicides or shootings, you know, on its face you think the entire city is a dangerous place. Uh, but you reduce those perceptions uh, by continually all the things that I talked about this morning about, you know, partnerships, changing a culture in a community. Because when you want to talk about advocating for a city, if you have pe people who live in a community who are saying they are afraid, that goes viral. But if people are saying, I feel safer, there was an area, and certainly this is nothing close to when you talk about drive-by shootings and homicides, but the, and I talk a little bit about this old port area uh, in, uh, in Portland, and they've had this historic thing where you go get drunk and you fight, beat people up. I, I couldn't understand it. I mean, I'm, I'm used to I know about drive-by shootings, but just to get drunk and beat someone up, I mean, I think it was a fisherman thing that kind of historically continued. And so I made a lot of public 
statement, people look and say, what's the big deal? This is the way it, life is. You know, that's the state smile, the way life should be. I said, well, the way life should be is not going to the old port and, 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 and for a night of entertainment and get beat up. But it was happening. But we took that on. And so guess what? People feel safe. They go to the old port now. People that would not go, young people that were afraid to go, go now. Yeah, they still have fights, but certainly not to the level. So it's education. And when people know what's going on, uh, it eliminates, you know how rumors can be. Uh, we had, uh, we got 38 homicides of 40 year to date. Oh, Cincinnati's a violent place. No, it's not. Now, if there's an area that needs our work, our partnerships, we do that. But that doesn't reflect an entire city. You know, you hear things, I mean, coming from Detroit, who uh, has, you know, uh, every year, seems like Detroit's in the top five of the most violent cities in America. I mean, I grew up in Detroit. I go to Detroit now. I'm not afraid, you know. Now, that doesn't mean I go everywhere in Detroit. I mean, I'm cautious. But this is not Detroit. This is not Boston. You know, you hear about Boston. Boston's a great place. Boston has violence. Cincinnati, great city, watch what happens. But as it was said earlier, I'm not a miracle worker, and it's going to take time. But I really, when I look at this, having come from other places, particularly I use the L.A. experience, not even close. When it comes to accountability of officers, I was just curious about your feelings uh, when it comes to, like, cruiser cam videos and... Um, officers wearing audio that's recording them, um, and when you think that's appropriate, if you think that's appropriate. I think it's very appropriate. Again, this is an opportunity of transparency. It's an opportunity to uh, let the community know you can trust us. Uh, a point in case, uh, Portland never had tasers, so and they were resisted, resisted. weeks of my appointment and the city council unanimously supported you want to know why transparency I decided it would be a great idea it's one thing to get the taser but we went out and got the more expensive model but it had video capability and uh, audio because I wanted to reassure the community that they could trust the work that was being done. And as it turned out, we cut our uses of force in half. Uh, in terms of a cost savings, there were fewer workman cop injuries of police officers. And so the folks who resisted uh, tasers, that were very vocal about tasers, uh, are believers now. But I had the good fortune of having police officers understood uh, the, the level of responsibility. and how yes. the manuals here and the codes. Absolutely. And we'll look at everything. Uh, you know, one thing I will tell you, having L.A. like Cincinnati, having come out uh, from a consent decree, you know, a consent decree is just an opportunity where police departments uh, develop processes and procedures that are best practices. And certainly some of those best practices are here uh, in Cincinnati. I know in L.A., uh, because of... Uh, the, mm -hmm. the issues that came up with the Rant Park corruption scandal, uh, the R Rodney King incident, uh, these things contributed to a very robust consent decree. It took seven years to get out from under, but now we have in place some of the best practices uh, that many other departments have followed. Uh, and when you look at consent decrees, whether it's Detroit, Cincinnati, uh, L.A., uh, there are some similarities, best practices in policing, so I'm a big believer in that. So we'll be looking at that, what works, what are getting out of, of jail. We wanted to let them know we were thinking about them, and we were encouraging them to go down that right path. But if you decide not to, we'll be there uh, waiting for you. Because you've got to have a no tolerance on violent behavior. But you've got to also uh, give people hope, uh, opportunity. Uh, and, and you'd be surprised just by merely sitting down at the table with people and talking to them. 
I am certainly not a police chief that's going to sit up in an office. I want to get out in the community. I want to personally have conversations with those that are out in the community. As I've driven through some of the neighborhoods and uh, because of my 35 years of experience, it's no surprise who's doing what. I can recognize them. I need to get out of the car and have a chat with them. They need to know that I know. And these are the things that we can do together. And that's important. So what specifically can the community do? Separately oh, the community place? can, well, the community is doing a lot here. I mean, in terms of, you know, volunteering, uh, there was one group I spoke to about the uh, reintegration piece, uh, you know, going into, uh, you know, I think it's uh, uh, not money well spent, but just an effort well spent going into uh, some of the local uh, prisons or jails and talking to people that are coming out as a form of an, an integration back into the community. Uh, but the one thing, though, I will say, What's important about that, you have to have credibility. And so if you have someone that has never been in the life of crime, uh, they're not going to have a lot of credibility with someone who's getting out, who's been in and out. Maybe someone who's been in and out, who has decided to go on the right track, is the person we want to send in. So that's how the community. So there are a lot of initiatives in place right now. Uh, I just want to build on them, take it to the next level. Uh, and in the coming weeks, I'm sure I will learn more. I will hear a lot. And I've heard a lot about it and understand it. And is that maybe an opportunity to, to take one of the reader questions from Ronald Grove? He was asking about citizens on patrol and detention. Oh, I love it. Love um, it. So he's, he's wondering if you, if you see opportunities to enhance that program oh. and expand upon it. Let me tell you, I, I think that's one of the best things, you know, a community giving back, uh, citizens on patrol. What a, uh, a great, I wanted to start it in, frankly, I wanted to start it in, in Portland, but I got a lot of pushback from, from the police officers, candidly, because they felt that uh, it would be taking jobs away. Uh, and I don't see it as taking jobs away. I see it as an enhancement. And let's face it, when you talk about this thin blue line and policing a community, we cannot do it alone. When you talk about a city of 365,000, and 1,100 police officers. We cannot be everywhere, every minute, every hour of the day. We rely on the community. So the partnership is key. And that's a great effort. Citizens on patrol. And then whatever we can do to enhance that, sustain it, keep it going is certainly uh, a plus. Well, great. Thank you very much. I Thank you. Time is limited. you got to get uh, moving here, but we appreciate your having this conversation with Thank us. you. And any time you want me to ever come back and want me to give you a checkup, uh, a three-month right. checkup, hey, Chief, you said, and believe me, I don't forget this. We got that all on it's record. Right, oh, I know you have it on record. <laughs> Hold me accountable. Okay. And if it's something I can't do, like I said at a meeting of, of officers, you know, hold me accountable. But if it's something I can't do, I'm going to tell you I couldn't do it. I'm going to tell you why I couldn't do it, uh, because that's important. Up on okay. That we Thank you. Look forward to seeing you again. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. We're getting out of of jail. We wanted to let them know we were thinking about them, and we were encouraging them to go down that right path. But if you decide not to, we'll be there uh, waiting for you, because you got to have a no tolerance on violent behavior. But you got to also uh, give people hope, uh, opportunity. Uh, and, and you'd be surprised just by merely sitting down at the table with people and talking to them. I am certainly not a police chief that's going to sit up in an office. I want to get out in the community. I want to personally have conversations with those that are out in the community. As I've driven through some of the neighborhoods and uh, because of my 35 years of experience, it's no surprise who's doing what. I can recognize them. I need to get out of the car and have a chat with them. They need to know that I know. And these are the things that we can do together. And that's important. So what specifically can the community do? Separately oh, the community can, well, the community is doing a lot here. I mean, in terms of, you know, volunteering, uh, there was one group I spoke to about the uh, reintegration piece, uh, you know, going into, uh, you know, I think it's uh, uh, 
not money well spent, but just an effort well spent going into uh, some of the local uh, prisons or jails and talking to people that are coming out as a form of an, an integration back into the community. Uh, but the one thing, though, I will say, what's important about that, you have to have credibility. And so if you have someone that has never been in the life of crime, uh, they're not going to have a lot of credibility with someone who's getting out, who's been in and out. Maybe someone who's been in and out, who has decided to go on the right track, is the person we want to send in. So that's how the community. So there are a lot of initiatives in place right now. Uh, I just want to build on them, take it to the next level. Uh, and in the coming weeks, I'm sure I will learn more. I will hear a lot. And I've heard a lot about it and understand it. And is that maybe an opportunity just to take one more reader question from Ronald Grove? He was asking about citizens on patrol. And oh, I love it. Said. Love um, it. So he's, he's wondering if you, if you see opportunities to enhance that program and oh. expand upon it. Let me tell you, I, I think that's one of the best things, you know, a community giving back. Uh, citizens on patrol, what a, uh, a great, I wanted to start it in, frankly, I wanted to start it in, in Portland, but I got a lot of pushback from from the police officers, candidly, because they felt that uh, it would be taking jobs away. Uh, and I don't see it as taking jobs away, I see it as an enhancement. And let's face it, when you talk about this thin blue line and policing a community, we cannot do it alone. When you talk about a city of 365,000 and 1,100 police officers, we cannot be everywhere, every minute, every hour of the day. We rely on the community, so the partnership is key. And that's a great effort, citizens on patrol. And whatever we can do to enhance that, sustain it, keep it going is certainly uh, a plus. Well, great. Thank you very much. I Thank you. Moving here, but we appreciate your having this conversation. With Thank us. you. And, and any time you want me to ever come back and want me to give you a checkup, uh, a three-month right. checkup. Hey, Chief, you said, and believe me, I don't forget this. We got that all on it's record. right. Oh, I know you have it on record. <laughs> Hold me accountable. Okay. And if it's something I can't do, like I said at a meeting of, of officers, you know, hold me accountable. But if it's something I can't do, I'm going to tell you I couldn't do it. I'm going to tell you why I couldn't do it, uh, because that's important. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you again. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.